It's functionally deficient, demonstrably obsolete, and named after a vocal segregationist. Is it time to say Hasta la Vista to the Matthews Bridge? Well, to join, to discuss that, we're joined by Alan Bliss, Chief Executive Officer of the Jacksonville History Center, and a very good morning to you, Alan. Good morning to you, Dan. You know, this is a topic that I'm very comfortable with, having done 40 years of journalism in this city. I actually covered the 60th anniversary and talked to people who had been part of the grand opening celebration and ridden across it in fire trucks, et cetera, and well aware that we don't have some of the things that resulted from it anymore. The Grand Hotel uh, in Arlington is gone. The Regency Square Mall is going to get redeveloped. But let's let's talk about, about why you think, and recently wrote an article for the Jacksonville Historical Society newsletter, called Jacksonville History Matters, and the title of your story was When History Doesn't Matter. What are you getting at? Yeah, so the Matthews Bridge is historic. It's uh, it, it's historic on the face of it because of its age. You know, there is a volunteer organization that has a website called historicbridges.org. And this organization of of knowledgeable, engaged volunteers, many of them professionals, actually rates bridges all over the United States based on their a number of criteria that make them historic. And they have a pretty well-defined matrix of qualifying factors, and they rate bridges as to their historicity on a scale of 1 to 10. And this organization rates the Matthews Bridge as a 9 on that level. If we, if you'd like, later on we can talk a little bit about what those criteria are. But it wasn't the first time that I had heard that said about the Matthews Bridge. You know, it has always sort of been a consideration of mine when I drive the Matthews Bridge, having seen what kind of uh, incidents can bring traffic to a halt, <clears throat> having experienced, you know, the feeling of slowing down. Somebody may be uh, driving hazardously in front of me, not having any alternative lanes to bail out into in case there is a serious accident or incident. So I don't think it takes a great deal of imagination on the part of any motorist to consider that this is, you know, not a safe modern bridge as we conceive those to be in the 21st century. Well, you know, this became, go ahead. Many of us, many may remember that the top of that bridge used to be steel grating and, and, uh, uh, that caused uh, many incidents, and there was one crazy night. Uh, I was up there covering a fatal accident, and I parked on it. I stood on that grating and realized that if I dropped my keys, I'd never see them again to the car. So I literally put the keys on the driver's seat to cover the case and then made sure to safely navigate back to the car. Scary to be there at night and see the waters below. But as you were about to say, there's there's reasons for the deficiency that that bridge has in the modern day. Yeah, and you make a good point. If you have to step out of your car on that bridge for any reason, it's a dangerous place to be, plain and simple. Modern bridges that have shoulders, break down lanes, and even in some cases go so far as to have bike and pedestrian paths adjacent to them. If you have to get out of your car and evacuate an accident scene on such a bridge, you've got you've got a refuge, a place to go, right? On the Matthews Bridge, no. You're safe on the Matthews Bridge only if you are inside a moving vehicle that's headed for the other end of the bridge and keeps moving. Otherwise, it's a risky situation. Uh, as I say, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to envision that. But yet it was the grand the grandest bridge uh, in its day 70 plus years ago correct at its time yes i mean it was it was a great leap forward in transportation alternatives for jacksonville you know the uh, the arlington community had been isolated from downtown jacksonville and the rest of the neighborhoods to the west there used to be a ferry that operated across that section of the river but it was only the construction of the Matthews Bridge that really allowed Arlington to connect and start to really grow significantly. And it was seen as sort of an announcement of Jacksonville's increasing structural and uh, and community unification. It was the product, Dan, really, of the assumptions of the bridge designers and traffic engineers of its time. And those assumptions really all rose out of automobile automobiles. It was the assumption was that anything that allowed people to go more places by car was a good thing. And 
you know, the advocacy for this went back to the 1930s. You mentioned the namesake of the bridge, uh, former uh, Florida State Senator John Matthews. He had been advocating for this bridge since back in the late 1930s. Not a lot of infrastructure projects made much progress during the early 1940s owing to a World War II. But as soon as the war was over, then there was an increased appetite for investment in transportation infrastructure. That happened all over the United States. And uh, the John Matthews Bridge was a great example of that here in Jacksonville. Literally, so. see the USA <laughs> in your Chevrolet. I mean, literally, um, when that opened, you get the shopping center, town and country. You get the Grand Hotel that they just destroyed uh, with the convention center next to it. And then in 1967, I believe, the first chunk of Regency Square Mall opens, allowing people from the west side and downtown to go to a shopping mall, which was a brand new uh, idea at the time. Yeah, some people blame uh, Regency Square for the demise of downtown's retail shopping. The fact is that it had already been going on for some time. By the 1950s, though, shopping centers in the suburbs were kind of uh, the nail in the coffin of downtown shopping. But what you also got, Dan, in the early 1950s was this tremendous surge of new construction of homes and commercial buildings, churches, all following the mid-century modern architectural style that was really emergent after the end of World War II. Um, there had been a, a lack of new innovative design and construction in buildings during the 1930s, owing to the Depression, again, a suppression of new development because of World War II. There was an appetite for something that was new and modern that sort of evoked the new jet age right after the end of the war. And Arlington was a blank slate. Architects, developers, uh, investors, homeowners, business people all saw this as an opportunity to really make their mark in a place that was emerging. So the fact that the Matthews Bridge connected that neighborhood to the rest of Jacksonville beginning in 1953 helps account for that surge of, Jack of uh, mid-century modern architecture that today characterizes that neighborhood throughout. It's one of the things that is, it's one of the things that is unifying Arlington's residents and, and its business community now in the 2020s. Arlington is, an, is a neighborhood that has been really reconnecting with its identity as a place that grew out of the mid-century modern period. And in doing that, I think that they see themselves as really beginning to come into their own, and I agree. I think that's true. But you the know, irony is, as, as I think about that, when I drive back and forth across the Matthews Bridge and think about what's going on in Arlington with its new renaissance, highlighting its, its architecture and its cultural background and strengthening its identity, the Matthews Bridge isn't contributing anything to that, Dan. In fact, it's impeding it. Well, if you're just joining us, we are talking with historian Alan Bliss about why he thinks it's time to start phasing out the Matthews Bridge. Do you commute on that bridge? Have you ever been stuck on that bridge? Give us a call at 904-549-2937. You can also email First Coast Connect at wjct.org or reach out on social media. So, Alan, give us some history of that bridge. I drove it probably last Thursday, and, and I remember few things about it. Obviously, there is the large monument on the Arlington side to when it was built. And then my impression is very low sides, very high center bridge to clear river traffic. And I still have nightmares about that bridge grading that they replaced with concrete. The big concern was that it was going to be too heavy versus the grading. So give us some bridge history. Um, and again, it's design now in the 21st century versus 1930s, 40s, 50s uh, uh, on an architect's table? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, the structure type of the bridge is a metal cantilever. Yeah. It's put together with steel riveted together. It's called a through truss bridge, and its approach decks are uh, metal deck girders, and they're fixed and paved with concrete. The, uh, the contractor was Bethlehem Steel Company of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. They are a noted nationally famous bridge uh, bridge builder. The local designer was a uh, Jacksonville firm, Reynolds Smith & Hills, based here in Jacksonville. And the bridge is 49 feet wide. <laughs> That's the total roadway width. And its total length is 7,376 feet. It's about 1.4 miles long. It underwent a major renovation, uh, a rehabilitation, we should say 
in 2007. And yeah, you're right. The main span length is the most notable part of it, the high span. That's about 810 feet. The 49 feet of width really is just enough for four traffic lanes and no median lane, no breakdown lane. There's really, as I said, there's no place to go. But that struck people in 1953 as being pretty unremarkable. The traffic count was much lower. Speeds tended to be lower. It's hard for me to picture what it must have felt like to motorists back in the, in the 1950s driving across it. But Dan, a few minutes ago, you mentioned the um, you mentioned the the disturbing behavior of vehicles when they cross that steel grate at the center span. Man, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to who remember that and uh, and indeed agree that they found it extremely dis disturbing and unnerving, uh, especially when it was wet. It was though tires lost their traction on that steel grating. Cars would kind of swerve and skid slightly. People's hearts were in their mouths as they were crossing it. Now, indeed, that, that steel grating has been replaced with a concrete a slab in that area put paved over the uh, the steel. So that seems to have abated some of those concerns. But I still hear from people who intentionally avoid crossing that bridge. And I have to tell you, my office, as you know, is not far from WJCT Studios. We're right next to the Star Veterans Memorial Arena. I live out in Jacksonville Beach, and so I have five different routes to choose from mm -hmm. when I'm coming into town. The Arlington uh, Matthews Arlington Expressway and the Matthews Bridge are one of them. Uh, but if I have a choice, I avoid going that way, just because I think the uh, the Matthews Bridge is sub up. It's substandard. I oh. frankly think it's it's unsafe. We're getting some phone calls from people who drive the bridge, so let's go to Lee on the north side, who uh, drives that bridge every day. Lee. Hi. You're on the air. Go for it. Okay. Um, I understand some of the dangers of the bridge and everything, but more people get in car accidents and all at intersections being T-boned. I drive that bridge every day to go see my family. My sister lives in Arlington, and I do delivery. So I go from downtown to Arlington like 50 times a day for doing deliveries. And if I can't go over the Matthews, then I have to go over the Hart Bridge and then come up the back way through University Hill. So um, that is a very important bridge to me um, and some of my family because we, we literally travel it three, four times a day. All right. Thank you. That brings up the next person giving us a yell. Stanley from the north side is wondering what should go where the bridge is. So, Stanley, you're on the air. Yes, I don't want to take up much time. Uh, sir, uh, good information, by the way. Um, my question to you, what do you think should be done about the bridge? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Well, it, we remember some of us when that bridge was hit and was out of service after a Navy supply ship hit it, and it took quite a while to fix it. So, Alan, anybody thinking about a replacement for this bridge and how long might it take to replace this bridge? <laughs> so. Every time there is a new mayoral administration uh, that takes office, I show up for the mayor's transition committee meetings. In the uh, in the 2015 case, uh, it was the Economic Development Committee Transition Committee. In the most recent uh, new administration coming in, I volunteered for the Trans Transportation Infrastructure Committee. And one of the people who came to speak to us was a representative of the Florida Department of Transportation. And it's the, it's the FDOT, Florida Department of Transportation, that actually owns the Matthews Bridge and has responsibility for it because it's on a state road. And I asked about the concerns about the bridge's age and about its performance capabilities and its structural integrity. And this gentleman from DOT sat in the table in the transition committee with his hands folded comfortably like a peaceful Buddha in front of us. And he heard me out. And he gave me a slight smug smile, like he'd heard from guys like me before for years. And he just shook his head peacefully and he said, that bridge will never be replaced. <laughs> so, hmm. and I said, why? And he said, because it's historic. That's what we, that's why we, we take care of it. But he said, our only obligation is to maintain it. We have no responsibility to make any plans for replacement. You know, as you I get it. And the, and the DOT is limited in what it can do because of its categorization of the bridge. So what my thinking is now is that um, our city officials, 
our legislative delegation, uh, if necessary, our congressional delegation, need to pull together and form a intergovernmental task force to start exploring the ways that we can replace that bridge. The earlier caller said that it's a very important transportation artery for her and her family. I get that. It is for everybody. It, it shouldn't be uh, eliminated. It should be modernized. It should, it should actually be replaced. Now, that's going to be extraordinarily difficult. Where do you find the land on either side of the river to connect the new bridge to? Uh, and what would the cost of that likely be? Those are questions beyond the scope of a humble historian like me, although I spent a lot of time thinking about transportation infrastructure. Uh, but those are questions for the people who really are the pros in that field. Will it take a long time and be fabulously expensive? Yes. Is it necessary and worth doing? Absolutely. You know, I've talked a little bit about Arlington's renaissance on the, on the east side of the river. On the west side of the river in the downtown core, we have another neighborhood, the historic east side community, that's also realizing its long-held dream of a neighborhood renaissance. And it seems as though that we are giving short shrift to both of those communities by allowing them to be connected by a bridge that really seems to be functionally obsolete, that you would never build again today if you had to. And finally, let me point out, we're getting ready to invest a billion dollars in a new state of the future that lies almost right at the west end of the Arlington Expressway. It's one of the major routes that people travel to get back and forth to and from games uh, and other special events in the sports and entertainment district. It seems to me as though the bridge is the weak link. The scary thing is, though, that as we had, I'm sure, Saturday night with the preseason game with the Jaguars, a lot of traffic coming into that stadium and leaving on the Matthews Bridge the only option one would think would be to expand by adding extra uh, spans on either side. And that's been done in other bridges in the city, going back uh, to the intercoastal waterway down to the Jacksonville beach. They put another second span there, et cetera, et cetera, allowing the center span to remain as it was. Um, We have a lot of comments on social media, Mike on Facebook, the Matthews bridge named for a segregationist. Mayor Deegan should appoint a task force to look at all names, markers, monuments that glorify racism. And would the historical society create that list. We've touched upon the fact that the Matthews Bridge is named after a segregationist. But what do you think, Alan? Is there a reason to change the name? I think it's time to replace the bridge. And I do not think that it would be appropriate to name a bridge in the future after that senator. He's noted mainly for his role in advocating for the bridge. And so I get it as to why the bridge bears his name now. It's not particularly celebrating his politics or his ideology or his attitude toward racism. Uh, So rather than focus on uh, on renaming an existing bridge, and I have no idea where we would go looking for another name for it, I think the appropriate play here is just to replace the bridge altogether and move on. Bruce from Callahan, in the case your guest is going to advocate for a big concrete bridge to replace the Matthews, production of concrete is going to put a lot of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. What about lowering the speed limit and putting up some signs that say safe following distance instead? Hmm. <laughs> Any comment, Alan? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know about that. Uh, lowering speed limits and telling people how to be better drivers has never worked particularly effectively in my experience. Okay. Now, uh, as, as I was talking about, as we've talked about back in 2013, a Navy ship hit that bridge 109,000 vehicles a day at that time were using that bridge. They'd have to go someplace else. Um, The authorities were afraid at the time, because I wrote part of the story on that, that the bridge with the damage to it uh, could not handle traffic until people were brought in to look at it. And I can't remember how long it was out of service, but I certainly remember seeing the broken uh, pieces uh, that uh, that hit. Uh, We've got an interesting call here. It's Jerry at the beaches. Jerry, you're on the air. Hey, Dan, Jerry Holland, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing fine, sir. That's our supervisor of elections, in case you don't know the name. Go for it. Well, I was calling because there's kind of a legend, an urban legend, that when they dedicated the bridge, which I think was in 1954, is that Johnny uh, Weissmuller was there and dove off the bridge. Is there any truth to that? I did not do that when I did the 60th anniversary story. I didn't hear that. What about you, Alan? Is is that historical fact or fallacy? Mr. 
supervisor, I think we're going to have to do a little research on that. Uh, if that's true, I had not heard it before, but it is a great story. I'd like to know the facts about that. And where, what height did he do this from if this indeed occurred? Um, if you're there between the, the island and Arlington, I guess that wouldn't be too high a height. If you're at the top of the span, that would be a uh, quite uh, splashalicious uh, <laughs> impact. <laughs> so, um, well, again, it, and here's uh, this other... You know, here we are, this 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 Navy vessel being moved from one side of the bridge to the other hits the span. Uh, but the bridge itself, Alan, uh, is deficient in many ways when it comes when it comes to to the boating around it, uh, the, the, the channel itself, uh, the, the bases of the bridge. Uh, what are some of the issues there? The issues there, Dan, are that the federal channel, that's the channel that is dredged and maintained by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, passes underneath the bridge. Now, it's true that the, that the channel at that location is not as deep as it is at the lower sections of the river, down around the main street, excuse me, down around the uh, Napoleon Bonaparte Broward Bridge. But ocean-going ships approach in the St. Johns River as close as the docks, really just a few hundred yards to the north of the bridge. And the site that's used by southeastern Toyota distributors to offload their ocean-going vessels carrying New vehicles from Japan is very close to the bridge. Tugboats and towboats pushing large ocean-going barges approach even closer than that to the bridge. Uh, Crowley Maritime has operated a major ocean-going barge facility close to that. Uh, barges that are being transited up the river pass beneath the bridge on their way to destinations further upriver, such as Green Coast Springs. The fender system around the piers for the bridge may have appeared to be adequate at the time that it was built and perhaps even when it was re re uh, rehabilitated in 2007. But really, they're no more consequential than the set of timber built, timber pilings that you see around intracoastal waterway bridges, maybe a little bit more robust, but nothing like the fendering system that would be appropriate for a bridge that's engineered to withstand a strike from any kind of an ocean-going vessel. Uh, that's one of the points of vulnerability of the bridge. And ships that are uh, transiting the river on their way to and from the repair facilities, such as North Florida shipyards, uh, they also pass beneath the bridge, and it presents a navigational hazard to the pilots of those vessels. And the proof of that is, as you just mentioned, Dan, in 2013, it was a military sea lift command uh, vessel, I believe. Uh, that inadvertently struck the bridge and damaged it. And yeah, it was out of service for traffic for over a month until it was uh, restored and tested and found to be okay to be returned to service. Well, the it's DOT just about departure. It's just about departure yeah. time. Let's get one more question in. Lewis from Ortega. Lewis, uh, what's your question? Hey, good morning. I, I tuned in maybe just a bit late. I may have missed something, but I'm just trying to understand what is this fascination that we have in Jacksonville with tearing everything down? Everything old needs to be torn down when we don't even necessarily have plans for what we'll do with the land when we tear it down or the space. And then I'm like, um, and this is just kind of a sidebar. Um, could, well, in, in the main in the main theme. Uh, the Matthews Bridge, could it not be converted to all those lanes going in one direction and then you put another bridge on top, like I've seen in Manhattan, and then the lanes are going in the opposite direction on the new? Also, like when you look at how we keep tearing everything down, we're forgetting about our history. And look at the code of these new buildings going up that are all wood frame, like Main Street and the other one, the apartments that caught on fire. When we tear down everything new, are we not losing sight of what happened in the past and have the codes enforcement like Lewis, we, we've got to wrap we up but thank you let me see if alan can you answer that alan obviously historical society uh very much interested in preserving um can we preserve it again i'll ask the question yeah the caller makes a lot of good points and there was a lot in that question you know it may seem a little contradictory that an organization such as mine that advocates for historic preservation is in this case advocating to eliminate something that really is historic but it's just proof that preservation needs to be smart and sustainable all uh, right we advocate for preserving buildings that have historic value but they have to be sustainable in the 21st century and this bridge is an example of something that is not thank you alan bliss head of the jacksonville historical society Thank you very much, sir, and we'll catch you sooner or later.